fishing is very important here. It's our culture, it's the way we live, the way we hunt, the way we farm. We use the bow and arrow for fishing in the shallow water. And so I would stand on the bank to wait for the fish. And whenever I say fish, then I can shoot him. The food that I enjoy cooking is roast fish. We just eat it naturally. Maybe that's why the Amerindian are so strong today. We don't really suffer with any sickness. There are different groups of indigenous people, but we are from the Mokushi. Baskets are mainly made by the male because it is like a tradition for men to do handicrafts. For us, the indigenous people, what I believe is to maintain our culture, our way of life, to be identified. I learned to make cassava from my grandmother and mother. Cassava bread comes from the roots of the cassava tree. It's important to squeeze all the poisonous juice from the cassava. We've been using the cassava bread for hundreds of years in the indigenous communities. Armenian culture is important to my life because it was handed down from generation to generation. Cotton comes from plant. We make hammocks, slings, handbags. We make the clothing. We live this natural and a communal life because it brings that strength. It brings perfect togetherness. This is wonderful. Hello and welcome to the Environment Matters, a monthly production of the Environmental Protection Agency in Guyana, where we explore the work of the agency in fulfilling its mandate of environmental protection and biodiversity conservation. On last month's episode, if you tuned in, you would have seen our host discussing biodiversity related matters with officers of the Multilateral Environmental Agreements Unit at the EPA. And during their discussion, during their discussion, they looked at MEAs and Guyana's progress in fulfilling its obligations under the various MEAs. In this month's episode, we will continue our discussion on biodiversity conservation by having a chat with Mr. Sean Mendonzo. And at this point, I'd like for Mr. Mendonzo to introduce himself. Thank you, Arita. So I'm the policy and technical coordinator on this Darwin Initiative project. It's titled Integrating Traditional Knowledge into National Policy and Practices. Mm -hmm. And I'm based at the Environmental Protection Agency for the duration of the project. Okay, that's wonderful. And for those who would have worked with the agency before, Sean is no stranger to you. And for those who are in the field of biodiversity conservation, you would know Sean. He was previously at the EPA and you know, I know he is very deeply interested in this particular subject. So we're talking about traditional knowledge and for the benefit of the viewers who are not exactly au fait with what traditional knowledge is, um, I'd like you to just shine a light on that a bit and then we'll get into our discussion on the project. Sure. So when we speak of indigenous peoples, we usually hear the term traditional knowledge alongside them. So traditional knowledge based on the Convention on Biological Diversity's um, definition refers to the knowledge, practices and innovations of a group of people in a particular region and that knowledge, innovations, practices, it's not usually recorded. Uh, mm -hmm. but it's passed from one generation to the next through stories, etc. All right, so how does traditional knowledge then relate to biodiversity conservation and in the context of Guyana? Very nice question. So as, as, as we will learn, as we get further into our discussion, mm -hmm. Biodiversity conservation is a big topic right now. Um, for, for the past decades, it's, it's been realized that action needs to be taken to help slow the loss of biodiversity. Uh, when we look at the, the Earth's surface, indigenous peoples, um, their lands and territories take up as much as a quarter of that space. Mm -hmm. And when we think of biodiversity, 
it said that about 80% of the Earth's biodiversity are found within those territories and lands of indigenous peoples. So it's become very, very much clear that a solution to, to the problems faced by biodiversity, we need to include indigenous peoples. Yes, indeed. So thank you very much for making that link between our indigenous people and the protection of biodiversity because we, we hear about it often, but I don't think we get an appreciation. And you know, you've laid the foundation for you know our understanding mm -hmm. of how traditional knowledge can help to reverse biodiversity loss, which of course is a major issue. It was highlighted in the Living Planet report. I think that was produced by WWF International. All right, so the project is integrating traditional knowledge into national policy and practice. And it is from the Darwin Initiative. Now, I, when I hear the name Darwin, right away my mind goes to the <laughs> that famous scientist, the evolutionist Charles Darwin, who would have given us the theory of evolution. Um, but, you know, tell us about the Darwin Initiative and how this project came to be. Sure. So in 1992, there was the Earth Summit in Rio. At that point in time, all countries were in agreement that there was need for serious action when it came to um, protecting the Earth's conservation and slowing its decline, uh, biodiversity rather than slowing its decline. So Darwin, who originates from England, the United mm -hmm. Kingdom, the Darwin Initiative was founded at that, that point in time with the purpose of supporting projects around the world, particularly developing countries, um, to do activities that would support the conservation of biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Darwin was just a suitable name, I, I, <laughs> I suppose. I think it is indeed. It is indeed for such profound work um, that he would have done. All right, so we'd like to know more about the project integrating traditional knowledge. Um, why was it conceptualized? Um, how is it going to be implemented or how has it been implemented because the project is already on the way? Um, we want to know about some of the partners that are involved in the project and of course, what are the expected outcomes? Because we have a lot of projects going on but we, we don't get a sense of how does this truly benefit Guyana and Guyanese. So, over to you. It's quite a lot, Arita. Yes. Let me start with <laughs> um, how it came about. Mm -hmm. So, the, this particular Darwin Initiative project, and Ghana has been fortunate to benefit from several um, UK funded Darwin Initiative projects. Um, this project came about from the fact that all countries have been working towards biodiversity conservation. Mm -hmm. As a signatory to the Convention for Biological Diversity, all countries have the responsibility of reporting on their progress towards achieving various um, targets that right. have been set by the convention. Guyana has done a lot of work in this regard. The Environment Protection Agency is the focal point and has been reporting um, as needed on, th on these aspects. So traditional knowledge is, a particular is of particular interest as, as we've highlighted already when it comes to conservation mm -hmm. and so under the CBD, Convention for Biological Diversity, they are under their strategic plan 2011 to 2020, and that's coming to an end soon. Yes. They have set out, they had set out 20 targets, refer to them as IG targets, and target 18 specifically speaks to traditional knowledge and the role indigenous peoples play, can play and have played in conservation. And so that particular target, this project, integrating traditional knowledge into national policy and practice is aimed at achieving and helping Guyana to um, report to this particular target. Um, we, as that, this strategic plan has been implemented over the past 10 years, reports coming, into this, coming out of CBD has shown that while there is some progress with the other targets, um, target 18, which deals with traditional knowledge, mm -hmm. is among a few that have not been showing much progress and so this project is, was very timely and it's helping Guyana to set a stage so to speak for the region in terms mm -hmm. of addressing and, and making pro progress towards this target. All right well Guyana has always been 
a, a trendsetter in the region when it comes to environmental matters. Trendsetter in a good sense, of course. Um, we even have a, a ministry that is dedicated to addressing the concerns and the needs of our indigenous people. So this project is just, I, I see it as one of the many stones in our, our very um, good foundation. Um, so tell us about some of the partners that are involved in the project, besides EPA, of course, mm -hmm. and how will the project be implemented or how has it been implemented so far? Okay, sure. So locally, we have the North Rupini District Development Board. Mm -hmm. They're implementing the project. And we're also par partners on the project, include the Environmental Protection Agency, as you mentioned. I'm based mm -hmm. there. The Ministry of Indigenous Peoples Affairs, which is now a Ministry of Amarindian Affairs once yes. again. And we also have partnered with, and we learn more why, the Protected Ears Commission and South Central Peoples Development Association. Um, these local organizations have been working together to implement various activities under this project. Um, international, prod all Darwin funded projects mm -hmm. are linked to international organizations. And so the Royal Holloway, um, University of London, and the United Nations World Wildlife Monitoring Center mm -hmm. are part of partners on this project also. All right, mm -hmm. so let's talk about outcomes of the project, expected outcomes, what has been achieved thus far. So I'm going to go back to IG Target 18. Yes. And that particular um, target seeks to raise awareness of the roles of Indigenous peoples mm -hmm. and their traditional knowledge and how that can impact um, conservation and sustainable use of resources in, in, the c in, your, in one's country. And so the project's um, major goal is to raise that awareness and to see stakeholders being able to understand this link between indigenous um, peoples and um, or activities surrounding development and conservation. Mm -hmm. um, that, that would be at the community level. Uh, the communities have a role to play in this and I'll talk about that in a bit, uh, but also more so at the governmental level. So the project has implemented activities over the course of the last few years to see local ministries and agencies being more aware of indigenous people's role and the traditional knowledge to conservation mm -hmm. and how they can better be able to integrate traditional knowledge into their work program. So this has involved consultations, obviously one-on-one -on -one meetings, and also training. I know we want to talk about capacity building a bit yes, later. Yes, we'll talk about that a bit later on in the show, of course. All right, so you did mention the public awareness, of course, is one of the main components of the project. And we do have an article that is featured in EPA's 2020 magazine that's called The Green Note. And so if you don't have a physical copy as yet, you're free to head on over to our website, www.epaguiana.org, and you can download a copy of that magazine. All right, so is there anything else that we need to know about the project before we head into our first ad break? Yes, uh, I mentioned that the Protected Ears Commission is an important partner on this project. Um, the project's um, work focuses specifically on communities in protected areas. Um, so that's a, a, a nice correlation to conservation and yes. traditional knowledge. There's a clear link there. Again, has five protected areas, and they are associated with indigenous communities who use the resources within and around those um, areas that have been designated as protected. So working with the Protected Areas Commission and those communities associated with protected areas, the project has been building capacity in those communities to develop a method of communication between indigenous peoples and governmental agencies so that we are able to see break down some of the barriers mm -hmm. that is preventing um, inclusion and integration of indigenous peoples in big discussions related to national development and conservation. All right, so thank you very much 
um, for telling us about the project. And I know Sean mentioned that we have five protected areas in Guyana. So while we are on our ad break, I'd like you to take some time, see if you know what those five protected areas are. And, you know, maybe we'll have a little trivia on our Facebook page. And the Protected Areas Commission has been conducting a quiz online um, in the lead up to the celebration of I believe it is Protected Areas Day. So um, that should be fun. Um, and with that, we'll take our first ad break. At the Environmental Protection Agency, we believe that the environment is everybody's business. We can start caring for our planet by becoming more environmentally friendly in our everyday actions. Here's what you can do. Dispose of waste in a garbage bin. Clean our drains, yards, and carpets regularly. Take a reusable shopping bag to the market. Support local butchers and farmers to reduce packaged waste. Plant a kitchen garden, trees, and flowers. Compost your organic waste. Conserve water and electricity. Carry a reusable water bottle. These little acts are good for your health and that of the environment. Remember, healthy people work better and achieve more and together small actions make a big difference for further information on how you can help please contact the environmental protection agency epa ganji street sophia or telephone us at 225-5467 you can also visit our website epagana.org or our facebook and instagram pages are you involved in a business or thinking about starting one do you know there may be environmental impacts from business activities? According to the Environmental Protection Act of 1996, businesses such as gas stations, rice mills, large-scale agriculture and poultry farms, large-scale mining and forestry operations, hotels and resorts must be authorized. Persons proposing any of these activities need to submit an application for environmental authorization to the EPA. Welcome back to the Environment Matters. In this month's episode, we're having a discussion with Mr. Sean Mendonza, who is the policy and technical coordinator of a project that is seeking to integrate traditional knowledge into national policy and practice. Um, so in the first half of our show, uh, Sean would have given us a background to the project, um, which, as, as the name states, it's looking at really using traditional knowledge to help us as a country to manage our biological resources and to use the knowledge that our indigenous people have to ensure that this is done in the right way. Um, so in the second half of our show, we will continue that discussion by taking a look at the impact that the project is expected to have in Guyana. And so to kickstart that part of our discussion, We'll take a quick look at one of the videos that was produced as part of the project. is working with protected areas. There are five protected areas in Guyana, and each of these protected areas are, have a number of so associate communities. Yokrima River Lodge, or Yokrima Rainforest, that we know it as, it's an area of 371,000 hectares, all forested area. In total, we estimate about 65 communities that we will be working with in a general sense to gather information. All local individuals from the communities are allowed to fish, hunt, continue their natural way of living. We are engaging the community using the community-owned solutions approach, looking at how um, traditional knowledge has been changing in the communities and how it has been impacting the protected area. 
Okay. okay, in communities, we are training six to eight young people in the use of tablets uh, to make videos for the communities. We're also training them how to do interviews, edit, to show to the community. We are allowing community members to participate so that they can be able to share um, information with regards to traditional knowledge. Participants that are working or participating in this project, they're very interested in um, using the visual me method because they're anxious in handling the tablets, doing the, using the software and these things. For the past six days, I really find this program really interested. Um, I really learned enough about tripod, how to use the tablet, especially for taking the different shot. It was really interesting. For the video editing, I, of course, I, um, I had it difficult also, but I collect the um, app on my phone and I am doing the practical of my own. I have attended this workshop for the last six days and I was very it was a very interesting workshop where I learned a lot about how to use the tablet, the adapter, the mic, and most of all how to do a proper video. The first thing that I ever done is interviewing a person which I never did before, right? This was the most challenging thing for me going out to face the, uh, the resident in my community. They participate with us because we are all local people. So they're not afraid of sharing and coming up with their own ideas and identifying their challenge because we as local people know the people, what, what they're talking about and how they're feeling and so. The members of this community, how pleased and how happy we are for such a program like this to be involved, to get our community members involved. We know that you have taken your time, your busy schedule to be here because you have a heart for the community. And thank you so much for choosing our community. So after the training is completed, the team which would have been doing continuous evaluations of the participants will then work with the village council to choose at least two part of the participants to then work on creating a certain amount of videos as it relates to traditional knowledge and the protected area. In the next month I would go and try to do more research on it and do more video about what we are doing now. I was like surprised that there are they mentioned my name, right? And feel to them that they have someone in this community that is able to produce something for them in the future. After that, we aim to take those videos to the stakeholders in Georgetown, especially as it relates to the management of the Arakama Forest, since that is the protected area we're dealing with. In a way, it is our aim to have a video conversation between the stakeholders and the community so that there is an exchange of ideas and views about how the people, the community members see um, their traditional knowledge being used in protected area management. Doing such a video in our community and having people to see it from a different level, it would be a great benefit. To the people when it meet to the higher authority, you know, they, they, are, they are more educated and they cannot probably understand my writing. But if the video, put it in a video type and show it there, you know, people will see exactly what, what I'm talking about or what I'm, what I'm trying to pre, uh, present to them. This phase of the project, I think, is very important. So I think with the ideas of these elders and local people would be able to put forward a better management plan other than just leaving them out and not getting them on camera or getting the real vocalization of them. So we want to, of course, talk about that video, which is very enlightening. I've had a look at several of which um, we will, of course, provide the, the link for persons who are interested in, in having a look at the other videos that were produced as part of the project. So we'll talk about this one specifically. 
um, noting that one of the most frequently occurring project components is that of capacity building. In almost every project you see you know, capacity building, technology transfer as, as one of the main objectives. And this project is no, no exception. So Sean, I'd like for you to tell us um, how is this project been building capacity in the indigenous communities? Mm. So we, we would have seen in the video, uh, we have been working closely with communities uh, associated with protected areas, young mm -hmm. people, women and men included, and they have been been provided with training on in the use of part story um, video techniques. Um, this is a particular important aspect, a component of the project, whereby we're using video mediated dialogue as a means for improving communication between within communities and between communities and policy makers, decision makers. So in that video we have seen um, training that would have been received. Community members were able to are working on preparing videos. Some of those videos are for the purpose of documenting their traditional knowledge or addressing, um, raising awareness and talking about issues affecting a particular community and how they might solve it or if solutions are there, what, what they did. Now at the national level now or the community level, regional level, such videos which we refer to as community-owned solutions could be shared among indigenous communities. Uh, for example, if one community had a particular issue and they were able to overcome that locally mm -hmm. um, within their community, documenting that and sharing that with other communities who may be faced with a similar challenge would be beneficial. But then the video mediated component, this is where we're really seeing decision makers have the opportunity to hear from indigenous communities, uh, what, are their, what are their understanding of the issues affecting them and how they might better support conservation initiatives. Mm -hmm. So video dialogue has been um, prompted through this project and what we see is training of individuals at the community level so right. that they are able to produce short videos that document how they feel about a particular um, topic in this case, because we've been working with protected areas, we have focused on how traditional knowledge can be better integrated into protected areas management. And then those videos would be shown, taken, so to speak, to the decision, relevant decision makers mm -hmm. so that they can see here firsthand several community members in the video speaking, being interviewed, what are their thoughts, how they feel. What do, they, what do they think can be done to improve relationships and work towards the common goal of biodiversity conservation? And so it, that breaks down some barriers that the project has established in these communities that has slowed, not only in Guyana, but other countries, the ability of traditional knowledge being integrated into national policies. And so we are trialing, so to speak, video mediated dialogue as a means for government agencies to better reach out to indigenous communities and have them be a part of decision making for conservation and national development as a whole. Right, so while you were speaking, my, my mind kept swirling and I was thinking about the, the concept of capturing and archiving traditional knowledge. And so maybe we can have these videos um, as part of the national archives. And then to even have the concept of, you know, the capture of traditional knowledge on video um, to be transferred to other areas, to other aspects of um, not only governance, as in this case, but culture as well. Um, because I always thought one of the projects that should be undertaken nationally was to capture our seemingly um, dying folklore, all the ring games that we used to play as children, all of these things, you know, form part of our cultural identity. Lest I digress. Um, but that's a very good initiative because even the, the art of making the video of storytelling through videos is something that can be used. It's a skill that has been transferred to the local community and so that's one of the things I know that we 
want to have happen um, during these projects. If I could add, yes. you touched on something nice there. So traditional knowledge, we've, we've, uh, by def definition, we realize it's past, it's not usually recorded. And that yes. has been um, a challenge over the past few decades where we see some of these knowledge and practices being lost uh, for various reasons. And so it's come up in, in discussions with communities over the course of the project too, that mm -hmm. these are particular and they've prioritized areas where they think they need to improve on, work on um, ensuring that it's not lost further. And the video documentation is a wonderful, wonderful way for communities to do just that. Um, many things are changing, uh, which has contributed yes. to the loss of some of traditional knowledge and the culture. Um, the simple education system pulls young ones away from families, away from going to their fa to farms with their, with their parents and grandparents, where a lot of that knowledge is passed on. And so documenting on video for the purpose of ensuring that it's, it's, it's there and can be um, built into some community level um, mm -hmm. traditional knowledge enhancement is, is a possibility. When it comes to what they want to share, you said you mentioned a national archive. Yes. That's totally up to the community. The community, of course. What they want to document, they may decide this is just for com at the community level. Mm -hmm. This must not be shared outside of the community. And they have the power to do that. And that has been considered, uh, those are the things that have been considered as we prepare our videos too. Mm -hmm. um, I must say that the FPIC process, free prior f informed consent mm -hmm. and mutually agreed terms, has been. Uh, part of the discussions. Mm -hmm. um, communities prepare videos. We would not share that um, outside of that without their consent. And so that's something to think about too, post-project. Yes, indeed. Um, especially when you, you mentioned FBIC, because of course we do need the consent of, of those communities before we, we distribute any of their traditional knowledge. But, you know, it was just a suggestion and um, which will lead me now into talking about how my traditional knowledge be integrated at the various levels, at, at the departmental level, at the ministerial level. You know. mm -hmm. Let's Very talk about that. Yeah, so this brings us to another output mm -hmm. that the project has been working hard towards. Uh, it's a national action plan focus on traditional knowledge integration. Um, this will see at the national level, should it be um, passed and uh, approved, all agencies in the country mm -hmm. having a look at the proposed activities there and seeing where they're fitting. What could they do to improve their engagement with indigenous peoples and to ensure that their rights are respected, that's for one, and how can, they be how can their work benefit from traditional knowledge in any way. Mm. So this for this traditional knowledge national action plan, we've been calling it, um, proposed actions have been prepared. And as we draw nearer, closer and closer to the end of the project, we're seeking to do national consultations. COVID-19 has prevented us from pushing ahead, um, but it's something that we are working towards completing for the end of the project. Like every, uh, every other, um, thematic area on the conservation, someone has to push it. Someone needs to yes. take the lead. Um, because at the agency level, an NBSAP is developed. So traditional knowledge, um, you'll see that a national, national action plan mm -hmm. trying to push the agenda, traditional knowledge integration, here and again, if it's, it's approved. Um, like every other team on the biodiversity conservation, mm -hmm. For Guyana, we have the National Biodiversity Action Plan, the NBSAP, which is helping national organizations to see how they might contribute towards the country's efforts of progressing towards meeting the goals under the Convention for Biological Diversity. Traditional knowledge is not a standalone. It's part of that, that net mm -hmm. network, um, but we need a champion. And so the Ministry of Amarin and Affairs has been working closely with us in development of this um, a draft at this time, mm -hmm. National Action Plan. And we're hoping, as I mentioned, to go to the national consultation so that it can be finalized at least before the end of the project next year. Can you share 
one or two of the components of that action plan mm -hmm. sure. that is being developed. Sure. And again, uh, it's important to mention that these are all evidence-based or discussions with the various mm -hmm. communities over the period of the project has allowed us to engage in conversations with them, uh, a workshop kind of setting where they talk about the issues related mm -hmm. to traditional knowledge in their communities, how they feel about areas that uh, particular traditional knowledge components that are fading, that need to be worked on, and how it mm -hmm. might be better incorporated into development plans. And so based on those discussions, that informed proposed actions. Okay. So some of those actions involved, the big one obviously is at the national level, decision makers need to be better aware of the role indigenous peoples play in conservation and they can play in national development. Um, the action, the, uh, propo another proposed action brings in that whole trialing that we're doing during this project of video mediated dialogue, mm -hmm. where th an action is proposed where it is used as a means at the national level to communicate with indigenous communities on various topics that, that would lend to national development input. Um, one big topic that's coming up in all communities is the language. Language oh yes. is, a, is an issue. So one of the proposed actions is talking about assessing ongoing um, language projects. There are a few there, Mokushi in the North Rupununi and Wapishana in the South. How might those projects be improved and scaled up? And how can those be used as templates developed for the other um, indigenous languages? All right, so I know you're coming down to the end of the project, and I'm glad that you mentioned languages because at some point about two or three years back, the University of Ghana did have a language project that involved Amerindian communities. And, you know, this, this would be a good point. You know, I know your project confidence would have already been developed, but it would still be a good point to work with the university and with the Ministry of Culture, Youth and Sports to really push having um, indigenous languages more integrated um, where necessary or where relevant. Very true. And so they would be important stakeholders to be mm -hmm. um, part of the consultation. We have engaged them in development of training also, so they're, mm -hmm. they're aware of the, the proposed um, the action plan in the making. And of course, the actual actions, we have highlighted proposed persons, uh, organizations that could take a lead. Okay. So All right. So that brings us to the end of our discussion. Sean, I don't know if you have anything further to add that you'd like to leave with our viewers as it relates generally to, to biodiversity conservation. I know you're an avid birder. I, yes, I, I had to mention that. Um, and, and you've passed a bit of that on to me when we work together. It's now, you know, one of the activities that I enjoy doing with my children. So, you know, if there's anything you'd like to leave with our audience, um, now is the time to do so. The entire program has been focused on conservation and it is a hot topic. I just want to, I want to come down to a, to a lower level. Mm -hmm. um, it all begins with relationships, our love for, for nature, conservation. It begins with relationships. And my first encounter with, uh, with talking about conservation by diversity mm -hmm. was as a young child. My grandfather showed me a bird, since you talked about birds. Yes. And that was enough. So. There, there's lots of, there's need and there are lots of um, initiatives on the way in Guyana to see young people showing that interest, mm -hmm. building that interest. So as they get older, it informs their decisions and they have respect for nature. Um, when it comes to the rights of indigenous peoples, respecting indigenous peoples, personally for me, I'd say it begins with friendships. One of my first indigenous friends, Amerindian friends, um, is the one who got me excited about a part of Guyana I had never seen before, the Rupununi. His name is Borti Javier. He now works I at the regional level in Region 9. Mm -hmm. His 
sister is actually on a project based at the North Rupin District Development Board. Mm -hmm. But we need to have, at even at the, and my point I'm trying to make is even at the very youngest age, we can begin mm -hmm. to, to learn about different cultures and that it's in yes. itself lends to conservation in the future. So, um, I mean, simple projects such as at the primary school level, a teacher can network with a primary school teacher in an indigenous community, and there can be an exchange of letters, letter writing, where you have coastal youth mm -hmm. learning about the culture of a hinterland youth. And that, that I, I am certain, in the future, will contribute to conservation. It most definitely will. It most definitely will. All right, and with that, we come to the end of our show. We'd like to thank Sean for being here with us today. Uh, thank you for staying tuned. Remember, you can stay updated with news coming out of the EPA by following us on social media, like our Facebook page, follow us on Instagram, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and of course, you can pick up a copy of the Sunday Chronicle or the Ghana Times um, to get a read of the information that we put out on a weekly basis. And of course, stay tuned to radio. We are on radio. Um, and remember that the environment is everybody's business. And of course, we have the ban on single-use plastics set to be implemented in 2021. And of course, now is the time to get on board with that ban. It's very easy to live an eco-friendly lifestyle. And of course, involve your children, as you, you would have heard in the parting words of advice. Thank you very much. And we'll see you on next month's episode. Notice the other day, I had a big, big campaign with them police officers. So shutting down them people, barbecue, wedding, dance. Man, how y'all expect these people to make money and survive? Oh, Miss Cheryl, that is far from the truth. The EPA and the Guyana Police Force are actually working together to ensure that persons who conduct certain businesses and activities are authorized. We've tried to allow them to adhere to the noise regulation. Well, this is going to be a new law. What lie is this? These laws were always in place. It's now that we're getting all these complaints at the agency, we are trying to enforce them. The Environmental Protection Act has been in place since 1996, and it states that persons and businesses must apply for environmental authorization before operating a song making device. Well, girl, I never know this thing is prior to the law. So if you're keeping a barbecue or an open air function, like a wedding or a concert, especially in your community, Right? And you're playing a music system, you have to apply for a short-term noise permit. And for persons that operate in a business and you got generators and stuff, you have to apply for a long-term permit. And that is applicable to bars and hotspots and clubs also. Well, now that you explain it, I understand it. It's unfair to the elderly, sick people, and even them little children. That is correct. According to the World Health Organization, loud noise can cause stress, sleep deprivation and hearing impairment and I sure you wouldn't want that. Oh, now I understand. Thank you for explaining it, Miss Sue. For more information, you can contact the EPA at 225-5471 or visit our office at Ganji Street, North Sophia, Georgetown. At the Environmental Protection Agency, we believe that the environment is everybody's business. We can start caring for our planet by becoming more environmentally friendly in our everyday actions. Here's what you can do. Dispose of waste in a garbage bin. Clean our drains, yards, and carpets regularly. Take a reusable shopping bag to the market. Support local butchers and farmers to reduce packaged waste. Plant a kitchen garden, trees, and flowers. Compost your organic waste. Conserve water and electricity. Carry a reusable water bottle. These little acts are good for your health and that of the environment. Remember, 
Healthy people work better and achieve more, and together, small actions make a big difference. For further information on how you can help, please contact the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, Ganji Street, Sophia, or telephone us at 225-5467. You can also visit our website, epagana.org, or our Facebook and Instagram pages. Are you involved in a business or thinking about starting one? Do you know there may be environmental impacts from business activities? According to the Environmental Protection Act of 1996, businesses such as gas stations, rice mills, large-scale agriculture and poultry farms, large-scale mining and forestry operations, hotels and resorts must be authorized. Persons proposing any of these activities need to submit an application for environmental authorization to the EPA.